find sets of locally finite parameter based on the divergence theorem. And what we're going to do today is I want to give, first I'm going to present some um, inequalities. Um, Z will talk a little bit more about them. I'm not, there's a princess involved, so she will tell you the story. <laughs> um, and then we're going to talk about, we, we drew a couple of sets of locally finite parameter. I'm going to draw a couple more. And then um, we will kind of look at the good pieces of the boundary of these sets. And then we'll continue. Hopefully, I'll have a chance to show that Thanks to looking at the minimizing problem that I had introduced at the very beginning of yesterday, looking at it in the context of the sets of locally finite parameter, we can find a minimizer. Okay, and if the hour is very long today, I will have ch chance to prove um, a density estimate. And if not, we will do that on Thursday. Well, prove, present a density estimate. And the reason why I want to focus on that is because when I got in the class I was teaching, when I got to the density estimate is when I realized, oh, I can use these for something else. Okay? And then after that aha moment, we will move to the something else. Okay? So let's see what we are. And so the first, yeah, just making sure that the microphone doesn't fly. Um, so the first theorem I'd like to present, I'm just going to draw a picture of what it means, but it's important. Theorem, isoperimetric inequalities. And so they said there exists constants. So we live in Rn and C2. Who knows what they are? It doesn't. I'll, I'll tell you in a little bit, a little bit about them. In Rn, so these constants are my constants are always positive. Okay, so I don't even have to write that. Such that if E in Rn is a set, let me put it a finite parameter, a finite parameter. Then two things happen. And I will draw the, uh, I'm going to state something, and then I'll draw the something. So ln, check it out. I was able to put ln today. So the Lebeg measure, I don't know how long it's going to last, OK? Don't, don't, don't get too excited. Um, so what on earth is this? What this is saying, remember, you can think of E as a C1 domain. So this is telling you, I'm going to draw it. Let me, it was supposed to fit here, but I'm going to draw. So E is this nice, if you want, you want a seat of C1 domain. And what this thing is telling you is that if you measure this, the area of this C1 domain, no matter which C1 domain it is, you can make it look like a flower, like a rabbit, like whatever you want. And provided it's at least C1 or, um, or um, a set of locally finite parameter, the area enclosed here is bounded by a fixed constant times the perimeter. Remember that funny measure there is the perimeter, OK? So, and the perimeter is this. So it doesn't matter how. what the domain looks like, the constant is always the same. An interesting question lots of people um, think about. The first question is, what's the optimal shape? Namely, what is the shape for which you have that C1 constant? Of course, you care who that mysterious C1 constant is. I'll tell you something about it in a second. And um, one of the things that Robin had thought about um, is what happens, OK, you know what the optimal shape is. What if you don't exactly know what the optimal shape is, but you know that the constant is close to the optimal constant, so is the shape Optim close to the optimal shape. And I cannot tell you who the optimal shape is right now, because I will be um, kind of hitting the, you know, breaking, screwing, 
hurting the punchline that Z is going to do today. So I mean, I, you know, you'll have to live with the suspense until this afternoon. Okay. Now. Okay, well, so I'm being recorded for posterity, and this happens to be Princeton. I mean, if I were at Berkeley, I would not. <laughs> okay, good. I said it, so it's fine. Okay, thanks. I've been authorized to use the word by Margaret, who's in charge. Great. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, okay. And then we also have the relative isoperimetric inequality. So let me tell you what it is. I promise I won't remove any other pieces. <laughs> 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 Can you no, I mean, it's always a concern. I take the sweater. I'm fine. I'm done. I'm done. OK. Got it. That got recorded, too. <laughs> They're not going to invite me here anymore. Don't worry about it. <laughs> no, I'm not. OK, and so the relative isoperimetric inequality tells you that the minimum of the Lebesgue piece of, so now, is the version of these in a ball. So, and don't worry, I'm going to draw it again, OK? Oh, sorry. I'm not seeing a problem. It's less than, OK. I'm going to write it in red since it's going to be small, but red is kind of make things look bigger. Is the measure on the ball. I am very sorry about these. So what am I saying? <coughs> what I am saying here is that I drew too big, so let me read more. What this one is saying is that imagine you have your set, but you're not interested in looking at what happens everywhere. So this is your set. And you take a point, and you take a ball. OK? And what this is telling you is that you lock off. So we're going to put in white. So white is B. This is the center is here. This is R. Is B of x R minus E. Orange is B of xr intersection e. And what this is telling you is that you look at the one with smaller <coughs> area. I did this picture really well. They look identical. But <laughs> you, know, you look at the one with smallest area, and it's always bounded. And actually, I should have emphasized why n minus 1 over n. Because if you really think in R2, this is like a two-dimensional thing. This is like a one-dimensional thing. So you need, you're just doing the scaling so things both are one-dimensional. Okay? Think of the ball. This will be like an R to the n. And this will be like an R to the n minus 1. So by putting that power, I'm fixing things. And what this is telling you is that the smallest of the two masses, two areas, is bounded by the perimeter inside the ball. So this piece here and this piece here. Okay. So this is the thing in red over there. And as you will see, these are very useful um, inequalities. They are related. You might wonder, you know, one of the things one wonder is what are these C1 and C2? And so if you're a little bit more advanced and you have uh, heard about it, the C1 and the C2 basically have, are the Sobolev and the Poincaré inequalities. And these are proved using what's called Sobolev and Poincaré inequalities for bounded variation functions. But if you've never heard about it, just forget that I said that. And we, you know, we can keep on going. Questions? Thank you. Um, no. What happens is if you think of, if we think of it, what mu I is, <coughs> let me draw a picture again. Mu E is a perimeter measure. So what, so what mu E measures, even in, so now, I, this is Rn, correct? But mu E lives just on top of here. So when I say mu E of Rn, I know it looks, it, mu e for points over here, mu e is zero. So it's only picking up this thing. 
Okay. And by that, I mean I take out the whole thing. Okay. Thank you for the question. Okay. There's a modified um, relative isoparametric inequality, but I think I'm not going to do it. And so let me look. So this is a set of locally finite parameters, correct? Let me remove this little kink here. I really want to smooth it. Um, this is another. OK. Um, remember, we already we the reason why I could have put like things going in here, like thin dendrites and stuff, but we decided that we're not looking at those. The representative we're looking at look more like this. Okay, we have a version of the divergence theorem here, which is the classical divergence theorem, and we have a version of the divergence theorem here that using this thing that I call the um, Measure theoretic unit normal and the um, and the perimeter measure, the radon measure that some of you maybe never saw. And so what the next the reason these these types of sets were introduced is because when we saw in the minimization problem, the first thing I drew yesterday, when we minimize, we don't obtain something that's C1. And what we're trying to do now is try to say, OK, if you look at this one and this one, you can focus on the differences. Oh, yes, they're different. But I would like to focus on the similarities. And so I need to define a set that tells me how they're similar. And so how uh, you can focus on these points, but I would like you to focus on the straight and the smooth edges. Okay. So what I'm about to define, in some sense, are the smooth parts. They might not look as smooth as you would like, but it is what it is. Okay. So the smooth part, in quotation, I'm not going to call it that, so it's called the reduced bound definition. If E, and maybe I should write the divergence theorem first so that we have it. Remember, for the set of locally finite perimeter, we have, sorry, we have this integration, OK? Where this is true for every phi, which is C1 with compact support from Rn to Rn. Nu of E is the measure theoretic unit normal. And mu of E is the perimeter measure. And I remind you, if, if E is C1, let's write it in yellow. So E C1 domain. So it has a nice boundary. This is the outward unit normal. Remind you what that means as a unit normal that goes outside. Outward unit normal. And this thing here is the surface measure. And you saw yesterday the definition of how surface measure, so that can be written as this thing. Okay? So remember, depending on your comfort level, what I'm about to say, I'm about to say something about this setting, but you should, if you prefer C1 domains, then I want you to check who the set I'm about to define is, okay? Okay, so definition. No, this is not a good place to start the definition, it won't fit. Definition. in Rn set of finite perimeter or of locally finite perimeter, doesn't matter. The reduced boundary and, and the field is very funny. So the reduced boundary is this set that has a start on top. Later on, 
most likely on Thursday, I'm going to start put a start on the bottom. Yes. Uh, would you mind explaining the uh, perimeter measure once more? Sorry. That uh, perimeter measure. What you mean by perimeter measure? The so the the way. So let's go to C1 first. Okay. If I have a nice smooth domain, let's think of a domain in R3. Okay. And it's so the domain is kind of imagine a square, a, a pair, okay, without the stem. <laughs> so the surface measure will be the, the measure, the area of any piece of skin of the pair, okay? Now, what we did um, yesterday is we define a more general measure. We define sets of locally finite perimeters at sets where if you look at, I guess it's the left hand side, phi is C1 and the phi is bounded by 1. You take the soup of that. One of the things I told you, if that, that number is bounded for every phi, then you can write it this way. This is like if you've never seen these, take it as a representation that been um, purely from functional analysis. And so that mu of E with bars represents the generalization of the piece of skin of the pair <laughs> in a more ruggedy domain. OK? So any other questions? Okay, so the reduced boundary, as I was saying, the, I put a start on top on Thursday, I put start on the bottom, is somebody else, and then I'll tell you how they relate. The reduced boundary is a set of points x in Rn, we'll see where they really live, okay? So such that. Three things happen. X belongs to the support of mu e. I remind you we defined that um, yesterday is the place where all the balls, um, the measure of all balls centered at X and radius R are positive because we're choosing the right representative. This is going to be the same thing for the correct representative. Two. Oh, I guess. I'm going to write something here, and then I'm going to do an example. Okay, so I'm going to take b of xr. I take this funny measure function e. Y. I put d. Let me not do that. D mu e. So, and I take the average. So what is D? So I am choosing the points where the measures of the balls are always positive. So what I'm writing here makes sense. I'm not dividing by 0. And what do I want? So maybe before I say anything to that, let me take, you talk about Lipschitz functions, and you, talk, you know what a continuous function is, OK? I want to do a little. So let me imagine for the minute that f from r to r is continuous. I take an x naught point from Rn into Rn into r, sorry, is continuous. I take any point here, and I want you to think for a minute what happens when you look at the b of x naught r of f, and you look at the average. Well. I'm going to do something. I'm going to add and subtract f of x naught. I put f of y. I put f of x naught inside. And I take it out. But since it's an average, I'm dividing by the, by the measure of the ball, which is what I'm integrating. I have f of x naught. My function is continuous. I'm assuming my function is continuous. So if r is small, this will be small.
And the smaller and smaller R gets, the smaller the number inside gets, and the integral, the average of the function 1 is 1. So as R goes to 0, this goes to 0. And so this number over here goes to f of x naught. Okay? So, okay, well, this was for a continuous function. Most of you have seen that. But so, why do I do that? Because this is the second condition I want. I want to, the reduced boundary only picks up the points where the average converge to what you would like them to converge. And so that's nu e of x. And the third, the third property I want, so I want what this translates to, the reduced boundary is picking up, this is, these are the Lebesgue points of this measurable function, nu of e. Okay? So I want that condition. And the third condition, and don't worry, we'll go to the picture and we'll see who those guys are. The third condition is, remember I told you this was one almost everywhere, where I only care about the problem, the point where this is one. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so the homework, to correct my mistake, I leave it to you to think, what does my set look like if for R small enough, I ask for this average to go exactly that? OK? Thank you. Then you're going to make a homework problem and everything. Thanks. OK, limit hazard goes to 0 of 1 over mu e of e of xr. OK. And I only cared about the points where nu of e is 1. Okay. So I reduced this set. Okay. Let's go back here and let's think who on earth am I talking about and why did I do that? I think once I draw them, you'll see, oh, that makes sense. Okay, we're looking at the right representative, so that tells me that the reduced boundary is inside the topological boundary. <coughs> Do I have another mistake? Oh, that's great. How did I erase that? <laughs> because, wow, that's talented. No, but actually, I guess the point is I get my workout by doing left here. <laughs> Thanks. OK. So let's, let's think for a minute. OK, so I am choosing. First condition tells me I have to be somebody on the boundary. So I have to be somebody on the white set. OK. Let's look at the second condition. What happens in the second condition? It's telling me, so if I combine the second and the third condition, I want the ones where the normal is exactly one, whatever, maybe it was one almost everywhere. So where do things fail? So let's first think who doesn't fail. So if you look here, the norm, this is a beautifully defined normal. Actually, I drew it so it's constant, things work well. Okay. Here I drew this, and this is a beautiful C1. Actually, it looks smooth to me. Curve. So here things go well. So who am I excluding? Where do things not look like they go very well? Where I'm getting the sharp turns. So here, for example? Yeah. yeah. So you're right. These guys here. Wow, green. This is not in the reduced boundary. This is not. We'll do a calculation. Well, we do a. So these guys are not in the reduced boundary. <coughs> so why? Imagine here you're looking at this average, the unit norm. <coughs> Sorry. I'm going to be recorded drinking in this room where you cannot drink. <laughs> <coughs> So I told I would not be fine for that. I asked yesterday. <laughs> um, the unit normal here is going up. The unit normal here is going down. You realize the average, they're basically canceling. OK? Kind of you. If you take a here, half of them are going this way, half of them are going this way, these two components is giving you very small. For sure, it's not going to give you one. 
So what have I accomplished by doing these? I somehow seem to have picked up the good points. Okay. You might wonder how many of them there are. Did I really choose? Am I choosing most of them? I mean, there's lots of questions about it. Okay. Um, hopefully, Z will be able to draw some awkward things that show you <laughs> what can go wrong. Okay. Because we all want to believe, especially after this example, that okay, well, yes, it's almost every, except for a few things, it's almost everybody, and that's mostly correct, but it could be wrong. Okay, so, <laughs> um, okay, questions? Okay, so we saw who is not on the reduce boundary. Um, I want to show you another example of a bad point. Okay, just because. Okay. Sorry? For this one, first is new uh, defined on those corners, and also the second condition is satisfied on those corners. So, no, you see, remember I said nu was a measurable function, so measurable functions are only defined almost everywhere. So, in one hand, there's not a nice way to define them. But since changing a measurable function, a set of measure zero, you can actually tell me, I want it to be the following thing, but it doesn't behave well. And no, in particular, two doesn't hold there. Okay, yeah. So I would like you to focus, I need to make it a little bit more. I want to emphasize that, of course, at this point, same thing. The unit normal will not behave well. At this one over here, look at the average. Half of them go up, half of them go down. The average is going to give you zero. But other things will also go wrong. So when you keep in mind things that go wrong, I would like you to also keep in mind this one. In some sense, from my point of view, this one is worse than any of these ones. Okay. So yes. This is part of our pursuit of a nice, a class of spaces that does what we want. So, are you saying we're going to exclude? What, how does this help with that goal? Okay. So, I I I define the sets of finite parameter as this class. Oh, okay. okay. Now, so far, <laughs> I could have put awkward things. I mean, I've been. I've tried to draw nice things. You'll see ugly things this afternoon. But I am trying, you're correct, I'm trying to say I have some sort of regularity. I cannot expect to have regularity at all points. So I'm trying to pick up the set where things, where I have a chance to have regularity. Okay? So I'm trying to identify that set. Mm -hmm. So I chose this one. Seems like a natural one. I haven't told you how big it is. Okay, so keep in mind. One of the things of math sometimes is you go and you define these and you define that and you think, oh wow, I have a beautiful set. And then you realize I have not bothered to show you that's not empty. Okay, so one has to be worried, but I will show you it's not empty. And well, I gave you an example where it's not empty, but I don't think that's. Enough. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we yes, and it could be that the limit exists. Like if we look at at these points over here, I'm sure the limit exists there. And depending on this angle, it's going to give you a number. Okay, mm -hmm. but I don't want any any but number that. As long as the limit exists and it's not zero, it sounds to me like. Mm, no, because rem so from so from the me if I were looking at a measure, you're completely right. But I want this measure has a geometric meaning to me. I want it to be what it is in C1. If you want, I'm trying to pick up from this weird definition what what still is kept from C1. And in C1, I needed the the unit normal. Okay. If you think of it. It's rather than having, let's say, if I have a one there, I will end up with the surface measured. If I had a one half, 
I will have I will, will have the surface matter, and that that's not good for me. Okay. Okay. So let me show you. So I'm going to show you a theorem. It's the George's theorem, who tells you why I chose these, and um, and that in fact this is a nice set. So. Despite the fact that's not the best board technique, I'm going to erase these so that I can contrast it with what's upstairs. Okay. So. Remember, we saw a structure theorem yesterday. This is the second structure theorem. There will be no more theorem. Structure theorem. For sets of finite parameter. And um, I, something I should have said that I know it, it was somewhere. So if you at some point want to look any more about these, I am following two books at the same time at, to this point. In one hand, I'm l l following Craig, um, Craig Evans, Evans and Garieppi. On the other hand, I'm also following Maggie's book. OK, yes. Um, I will, how about, I guarantee that you receive it. So the people's names are, but you, if you ask me, the title one is, OK. So one is Evans and Garieppi. <coughs> There's two editions, either of them. And the other one is Maggi. OK? Thank you. Yeah, I thought you were asking me for the titles. And then I'm sure I'll get them wrong. There's geometric measure theory and fine properties of functions and things like that in the both titles, but you know. Okay. So what I'm, this theorem tells you is how nice the reduced boundary is. So assume e in you know, n of set of finite perimeter or locally finite perimeter. Several things happen. So remember, I've been trying to do the analogy with C1. And this is why. Then 1, the reduced boundary can its, I want to write it as a union. And I'm going to write in yellow something over there. k equals 1 up to infinity of mk union n0. Where where? Let me see. So the measure of n zero is zero. I don't see this set. And Nk is a compact so close and bounded compact subset of SK, and SK is a C1 hypersurface. So hypersurface. OK, so that simply means a piece of a C1 thing of the right dimension. Okay. Now, that mysterious, so. And if it's bothering you, you can imagine that these guys are disjoint. So what I'm about to write is perfectly fine. For so for the x that belongs to mk, what's the unit normal? So the unit normal to e at x in this k is exactly the unit normal to the surface sk at x. So is the unit normal the nice one that we have talked about before? And the perimeter measure, this funny, awkward measure that I define here, happens to be the surface measure. So let me first say something. If I were only on SK, it would be exactly the surface measure on SK. And since I'm not necessarily on SK, well, it's 
hn minus 1 restricted to the reduced boundary. OK? So now, so this looks really nice, correct? It's telling you the reduced boundary looks as smooth as we could hope for. Okay, we have countably many pieces which are C1. Um, the unit normal on the C1 piece is the unit normal I knew from before. And the perimeter measured on the C1 piece is the surface measure that I knew from before. Okay, now let me tell you what fits in there. Because we all, you know, we all are seeing this one, and then I come here. Okay. Let me show you. I said you could take them. Um, I know this doesn't look like the boundary of anything, but for the sake, you can remove this point. Okay. And then you see this fits this. And now this doesn't start to be so nice. And think of it, I could have done what I just did. There's countably many. And since there's, I can put one in each um, rational direction. And then you do the same thing on each one of these. And now it's not looking as pretty anymore, isn't it? So I can, just to show you as a salesperson, I can sell you a beautiful thing. And here is what's hiding behind the beautiful <laughs> definition. <laughs> So we're going to work to show that in some cases this is actually beautiful and it really looks like just one piece or just one big piece of something and you know, yes. Okay. Okay. So let me, one thing I wanted to write, um, I chose this version of the theorem because it emphasizes the similarities with C1 but often, so I could have written, you could go to a different book. So I said I'm using two books. And if you look at the two books, they might have a slightly different characterization. You might also find the following. The reduced boundary of E is included to infinity. An accountable union of Lipschitz images. OK, so, so I remind you that Z spent some time talking to you about Lipschitz functions. And Lipschitz, so a Lipschitz function is a function such that fk of x minus fk of y is less or equal than lk x minus y. OK? So you might find this statement. What do I mean? You might find this replacing this. I remind you, she showed you that uh, Lipschitz function is differentiable almost everywhere. Therefore, at all the points of differentiability, you will have a unit normal, and this will still hold. Okay? So, why do I emphasize this? Because this is what we call so, if a set, not just the reduced boundary, I'm going to introduce a word here, if a set satisfies this property, we say that boundaries is n minus 1 rectifiable. Oh, sorry. <coughs> Thank you, Penny. Thank you very much. Thanks. OK. So this set here is n minus 1 rectifiable. But again, that thing that I drew over there that had tons of line is n minus 1 rectifiable. Is 1 rectifiable and it's horrible. So in the title of the class, there was this word uniformly rectifiable. OK? And so, so for me, you know, the friend of what in math you are, for some people, a smooth set is a smooth set. Something that looks like that. For me, a Lipschitz domain, a Lipschitz set, you know, full of points, is a super smooth set. And my next favorite smooth set is a uniformly rectifiable set. That is somewhere in between. I'll tell you what it is. Don't worry. Um, that's 
the uniformly rectifiable set is between uh, Lipschitz domain and a rectifiable set. So one of the goals of of this class. So where do uniformly so there's there's geometric measure theory and quantitative geometric measure theory. And if you came, so we have been coming, uh, what I have been presented are things that come from geometric measure theory as it was introduced to do geometric analysis and variational problems. If I had decided to teach a class on harmonic analysis on non-smooth domains, I would have started by talking about uniform geometric, I mean, quantitative geometric measure theory. So if I were interested in harmonic analysis, I will, or in presenting harmonic analysis, I will be talking about a slightly nicer class of domain, so, so that you know what I'm talking about. I will, one of the things that I want to show is that the sets we're looking at are not only rectifiable, but uniformly rectifiable. What's the big difference? So it might not look like a lot to you, but in my world is like, you know, like between I don't know, Lipschitz and C infinity. Okay, so a uniformly rectifiable set I drew is a set which <coughs> when, when I look at the ball, so if I'm rectifiable in a ball, intersection in the set, what do I see? A countable, countably many Lipschitz images. So I see all of those. If I'm uniformly rectifiable, in 55% of the set, I see one lovely Lipschitz graph and then I have other things in the other 45%, but I'm happy with 55% being good. And 55% could be 15%, okay? I'm not too picky. So I want to, and why? Because if I have just one graph, I mean, things are nicer. I can, I can read of all these things. And I will try to show you. That's one of the places where we're going, okay? Questions? Okay, so now we have a good candidate. I want you to, want, so what do we have at this point? Let me remind you that because of, we know that the reduced boundary is inside the topological boundary, but we have no idea if they're the same, and no, they're in general not the same as we saw in the pictures. And the worst is that we don't know how different they can be. And also, everything I'm saying here is with respect to the perimeter measure, but I haven't told you, I told you the perimeter measure is really nice on this set. Therefore, the perimeter measure doesn't see the difference between this set and this set, but things could be happening there. Okay? Okay. Let's see. Siri always wants to help me. <clears throat> okay, so one of the things that is going to play a role, and you'll see, hopefully, I'll have at least the time to state it, is, um, is a compactness statement. So let me maybe, so that I motivate the compactness statement, what happens? I said we wanted to minimize something. Okay, so we're going to minimize a number, which is a property of the set, the perimeter of a set under some circumstances. So we're going to take a sequence of sets of finite perimeter whose perimeters are getting closer and closer to this number, to this minimum. And what do I want? I want to say, oh, check it out. The sets converge to something. The, set, the something is a set of finite perimeter, and the perimeter of that set is the minimum that I'm looking for. So, have sequence of sets, they need to converge. We need to check, make sure that that happens. So let me write the compactness theorem that we need for that, okay? So, I want to be efficient here, so theorem. So that's where we're going, that's why we need something like this. <coughs> compactness, so let E sub K be a sequence of sets of one finite perimeter in our n, okay? We are going to assume two things. We're going to put them all inside a big ball. Okay, this is the ball of center zero and radius r. Just choose one big ball. They all live in there. 
for some art, it doesn't matter which one. And two, we are going to assume that the perimeters, the total perimeter of this thing, and this should be mu of E sub k. I'm going to call it mu of k. Mu of k is mu of E sub k. We are going to assume that the soup, these perimeters are uniformly bounded. Okay. Think of it, these are the conditions that our minimizer is going to satisfy. And then what do we have? We have the following thing. There exists a subsequence. There exists a subsequence E and sub k such that E and sub k converges to E. I need to tell you what this means because it can mean many, many things. And so at this point, it means nothing. Nu of E, nu sub k, nu sub e, n sub k converges. E is a set of finite perimeter. E lives inside the ball BR. And this converges to the Gauss green measured of the E and sub k's converge to the Grau's green measured of E. Of, remember, this guy here is just nu of E mu of E. And moreover, and so converge, and I didn't, sorry, you saw con weak convergence. I think in Zihus. Um, notice when I put that, this for me means weak convergence. Okay? So that means again integration against um, continuous functions or continuous functionals. And moreover, the measure of u for any open set is less than the limit of nk goes to infinity of mu of nk of u. OK? So if, if you were watching um, the award ceremony this morning, one of the things that was mentioned was calcu the calculus of variations. And what I have just described here between the motivation I gave for this theorem and the theorem I stated is the direct method of the calculus of variations. I have something I want. I have a functional that I want to minimize. I define the functional in a large enough class. And I prove that this class has some compactness properties and a lower semi-continuity property that tells me when you take a sequence of elements in the class that are going to the number I want to achieve, I can pick up a representative in the class for whom the corresponding number is the correct one. So I haven't done it yet. I will do it afterwards. But this is the theorem at the basis of that. Okay. I need to tell you what on earth I mean, because <laughs> it looks pretty, but it doesn't say anything yet. What do I mean by this? So I say that E, so nk converges to E if the, remember, yesterday we talked about this set, which means E nk minus E union E minus E nk. So what this means is that the Lebesgue measure
converges to zero, as nk converges to zero. If you want, for those of you, this is telling you that the characteristic function of e and k converges to the characteristic function. If you've never seen what I'm about to write, just ignore the last line, <coughs> to the characteristic function of e in L1. Okay. Here is an L1 because everybody is inside the ball, but in general, I mean L1. Okay. You have a question? Yes. It's just notation wise that you have an NK and it's in general it's like K goes to Yeah. Oh I my thing so I have an NK because I chose a subsequence. Mm -hmm. But oh. then goes to infinity. Oh yeah, so NK goes to infinity, yes. Thank you. Okay. I remind you a subsequence is the events are the subsequence of the whole thing. So nk is always bigger than nk minus 1, and nk is always greater or equal than k. So, yes? Same question. You're saying that it should be k going to infinity? Yeah, yeah, yeah I was saying, but, but it's just not the But so when I have a subsequence, so let me maybe, when I have a subsequence, nk is a subsequence. I have two properties. The subsequence has always two properties. And k plus 1 is always bigger than nk. Yeah, Diana, it just means that you wrote 0. On the third line. On the here? Oh, OK. Oh, thank you for the translation, Sylvia. OK. <laughs> Feel free to tell me. You made a typo. I mean, <laughs> sorry about that. OK, thanks. OK, so that's what it means. And the weak convergence here, okay. the weak convergence, I'm running out of board, mu and k converging weakly to mu. It means that for every phi, which is C1 with compact support, I have to write these somewhere else. We have phi, I remind you, mu k is a mu n k, d mu n k, converges to phi nu, um, nu e here, nu e d. OK? Questions? So you will, and you notice, I have, sh I have told you that you're going to see lots of things in this afternoon session. This afternoon session is only half an hour. There's no way you're going to see as many things as I have promised. But you know, I just have shifted all my problems <laughs> to Z. And so but, uh, that's why you have an assistant, and <laughs> one that you know well. So, um, so what I'm going to do, so if she has time, she will give you an idea of why once you have these, you, the rest follows, OK, in this context. What I would like to do, I won't have a chance to prove it, but I would like to state the theorem that we started yesterday with this is a minimization question. I want to state the theorem. I will spend a tiny bit of time on Thursday giving you an idea of how one proves that. Now a lot. And then we will go to the density estimate. So, but let me state the theorem. And I'm not being very nice because if I go all the way to 11, Toti is going to be delayed, but with friends, she a five minute break, I think. Don't you think that would be a kind thing to do? We start at like 11.05. Perfect. As long as the break is after 11, you, we can have it as long. <laughs> My kindness level depends on the timing. <laughs> yes, OK. Thank you. We have a five minute break. OK, sounds great. OK, so you will have a five minute break after my five extra minutes right now, <laughs> which is all what I'll take to write the theorem. Well, I'm going by my watch, so you're A-OK. 
perfect. No, 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 I, I am. I mean, it says, for, you know, I have a lovely watch there and tells me I'm fine. But if you wanted to stop earlier, that's when I. No way. OK, <laughs> thanks. Proposition. So existence of minimizers. For the plateau type problem. And this is the plateau type problem that I drew yesterday, which I will redraw in a smaller <laughs> version because. So <coughs> let E0 in Rn be a set of finite perimeter. Um, B, okay, B is a large ball. Ball, okay. We're going to do it in a ball, it's easier. Did exist. So, E0, the ball did exist. <coughs> a set E of Exist. So you have a finite perimeter such that <coughs> E coincides with E zero outside of the ball. Okay, so E this is E outside is And the perimeter of E is less or equal than the perimeter of F for any other F, F of finite perimeter <coughs> plus U. Perimeter such that F coincides with E0 outside the ball. So E, as I said, is going to be this one. And what it says is no matter what other competitor you choose, what other F you choose, which is the same as the red thing outside, I need yellow, which is the same as the red thing outside, because they have to coincide with these. They all have to coincide. No matter who your f is, the perimeter of e is smaller. Okay? The perimeter outside is the same for all of them, so that doesn't count. The only piece that counts is this. Okay? And that was, remember, the perimeter, the minimization problem I started was, does a minimizer exist? In the C1 class, it doesn't. In this class, it exists. Questions? Talking about the uniqueness, is it <coughs> a nonsense problem or uniqueness? Well, it's not that it's a nonsense problem. It is an interesting problem, but the answer tends to be either no or not now. OK, so there are examples. There's lots of examples. And there are very weird examples where things go really wrong. OK? Um, so I'm going to leave it here. This kind of closes the loop that I opened yesterday. I'll spend a little bit of time, not a lot, proving some of the theorem, giving you an idea more than proving, giving you an idea of the proof of the theorem using that theorem there. You will have a chance to talk about that theorem either with me later or with Z later. And then we'll prove some properties about here. And then we'll move from there to the next chapter where I want to go. OK, yes? So should we think of this as you're saying that um, rather than thinking of C1 curves, we should think of sets of finite perimeter because there um, you have the existence of minimizers? Exactly. Because even if I started with E0 being a smooth set, OK? If it imagine, I mean, this, I wanted to be, this guy needed to be smooth. It's clear in, in the perimeter minimizer is this thing that I drew here, 
and here I have a problem, and here I have a problem. So if I insisted on being in the C1 class, the question is, no, I don't have a minimizer. Because a minimizer is, do I have a set in that class? That is. And that's why we went to sets of locally finite parameter. And that's why lots of GMT was developed. Thank you. Anything else? Yes. So it would be an entirely different question to ask what is the smooth curve that has the minimum perimeter? It will be a different question, but unfortunately, what will happen is the answer will be it doesn't necessarily exist. So, and since people, you know, if you, as, <laughs> as sub bubbles were mentioned, when you put a wire, you dip in and you come out, you see something. So the something exists, but you just need the vocabulary to describe that something. OK? Anything else? OK, we have five. Yes, you, you can ask me afterwards. We have five minutes. OK.